Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Black, and I am one of the Rogue Women Writers. We're a group of eight thriller writers whose backgrounds range from intelligence officers to cops to psychotherapists to journalists. To let you know how this is going to go, for you participants in the Zoom room, you will be in the gallery during the reading. We encourage you to introduce yourselves. For you, those of you joining us on Facebook Live, please comment if you have anything you'd like to tell the authors, and especially if you have a question you'd like to ask them. The comments will be monitored and relayed to the authors in real time. The authors will be reading only briefly, so there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. All of the books discussed here tonight should be available through your local bookstores. Four lucky registrants for this event will win a free book from one of these authors, and these winning emails will be announced at the end of the event, so stay tuned. As I said, my name is Lisa Black. I'm the author of 18 novels featuring forensic specialists, which happens to be my day job. I am based here in Florida working with my local police department, and I'm delighted to be emceeing this event. So we have tonight, we have Tracy Hunter Abramson, we have Stephen Tingle, we have Jenny Milchman, one of our own rogues, and we're hoping to have uh, Nicholas Meyer, but he is so far uh, AWOL, so we're going to hope he turns in, tunes in a little later. We will start, let me tell you about Tracy Hunter Abramson, was born in Arizona, where she lived until moving to Venezuela for a study abroad program. After graduating from Brigham Young, she worked for the Central Intelligence Agency, eventually resigning in order to raise her family. She credits the CIA with giving her a wealth of ideas as well as skills needed to survive her children's teenage years. <laughs> which in one sentence is why I didn't have them. Um, <laughs> she loves to travel and recently retired after 26 years, coaching her high local high school swim team. She has written 45 best-selling novels in 20 years and has won the LDS Whitney Awards eight times. In her new book, Hometown Vendetta, Luke Steele, military aide to the president, is reassigned to track down a terrorist suspect because the alleged bomber or a state championship ring from Luke's hometown. The same hometown Luke has desperately tried to forget. Now, FBI Special Agent Amber Lynn Reiner is willing to do whatever it takes, including going undercover at Luke Steele's, as Luke Steele's plus one at his high school reunion. Nightmares abound in this scenario. But as the threat of another terrorist attack looms, the stakes become higher than ever. And Tracy's favorite foods are chicken enchiladas and chocolate cheesecake. So see our website because we have recipes for both those things. So I have lots of questions for you, but for those parents um, who do have teenagers out there, uh, can you give us a quick rundown of what secret agent skills came most handy during those years? Okay, spying on my kids is definitely a thing that I did do. Um, but most of it was like actually practical stuff of. All of our, all devices had to be on the main level of our house so that we, mm. we just didn't let any cell phones and stuff because I just knew what could happen with too much access. So I think it was more of a strictness in some things rather than, you know, spying. <laughs> but I will admit that my daughter, when she found out that you could put a um, surveillance device inside of a houseplant, she has never accepted a houseplant from me in her life. So... <laughs> You know, try giving her a potted ivy and she's going to say, oh, that's nice. And yeah. And put, no. it out, put it out by the driveway or something. <laughs> okay. Well, Stephen Tingle was a certified golf course superintendent and golf course general manager, but then turned to writing and his work has appeared in various national and regional magazines, including Golfdom, Golf Business, Rob Report, Modern Luxury, Tempest, Town, Birmingham, and Discovery, which is Cathay Pacific's in-flight magazine. Stephen's debut, mod debut novel, Graveyard Fields, was published by Crooked Lane Books in 2021. Stephen is a member of the International Thriller Writers, the Authors Guild, and the Mystery Writers of America. In his new book, Buried Lies, Former police officer turned private detective Davis Reed is taking refuge in the mountains of Crusoe, North Carolina, 
When respected real estate agent Prentice Wells is killed by an errant golf ball, <laughs> Davis is hired by a wealthy couple to prove the death was murder and catch the killer. In need of cash, Davis takes a job. While Davis investigates who had the motive to kill Prentice, Elizabeth Harper, an accountant who stirs butterflies in Davis's stomach, uncovers a tangled mess of shady real estate deals, not that, you know, that sort of thing ever happens, you know, linked to Prentice's firm. With a local deputy whose mood changes with the wind and Dale's cousin Floppy, a mad genius motormouth mechanic, Davis must carefully navigate a minefield of secrets and lies. Now, Davis Reed's favorite snack is chips and guacamole. Think he's kidding? Davis Swinson blurb reads, I relish the roller coaster that is buried lies like P.I. Reed does his guacamole and chips. His favorite drink is Old Crab IPA, which this is not, this is just a problem. <laughs> Sorry. And which he brews himself. <laughs> now, one of your town articles was titled, Can a Middle Aged Man Survive a Disney Cruise? So now I have to know Can <laughs> a Middle Aged Man Survive a Disney Cruise? Barely. <laughs> And and I have to admit I I've done it more than once because it was my kids' favorite thing to do. But <laughs> but yeah, you 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 can survive and you after you hate it for the first couple of days, <laughs> and then suddenly the magic takes over, and you find yourself tapping your foot to a Jimmy Buffett song, and you think, oh my God, what's <laughs> happened to me? <laughs> and then. Uh, a few days later, you get off the cruise and tell everybody how horrible it was. <laughs> but for that middle part, you just, you're gone. You love it. I live in Florida, okay? Jimmy Buffett is like practically worshipped. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. You can't I, say anything yet. I know, I know. <laughs> and I once, I, yeah, I took an MSC cruise of my two sisters, Venice to Venice, you know, going to um, um, Greece and back. And it's... It, you know, going out of Italy and children travel free. I think one third of the ship was under 18. I am like, no, <laughs> but Dear they God. were all speaking Italian. So it actually wasn't that distracting, you know, the constant chatter because I couldn't understand a word of it. So, you know, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> oh, okay. Now our own rogue Jenny Milchman is the Mary Higgins Clark Award-winning and USA Today best-selling author of five novels. Her book has her work has been praised by the New York Times, New York Journal of Books, San Francisco Journal of Books, and more. She's earned spots on the best of lists, including Pure Wow, Pop Sugar, The Strand, Suspense, and Big Thrill Lip magazines, and has received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, Booklist, and Shelf Awareness. Jenny lives in the Hudson Valley with her family. In the usual silence, psychologist Arliss Shepard treats troubled children, struggling with each case to recover from her own traumatic past, much of which she's lost in the shadows of memory. At her new treatment center in the remote Aaron, 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 Adirondack, I know how to say that, I just haven't done it in a while, she, <laughs> she treats a 10-year-old boy who has never spoken a word, or so his mother, Louise, believes. At the same time, hundreds of miles away, Cass Monroe is living a parent's worst nightmare. His 12-year-old daughter has vanished on her way home from school, and Cass turns to a pair of true crime podcasters for help. Arliss, Louise, and Cass will soon collide at a quarter century old, as a quarter century old secret will be forced out of hiding, because nothing screams louder than silence. Now, her character's favorite drink is a good cup of tea. That's a woman after my own heart. <laughs> but before, before we get into your book, speaking of children, you recently dropped off your second child at college, which was quite an adjustment. So how do you think an empty nest will affect your writing schedule or routine? You know, I mean, I remember this every step of the way that like when they first went to preschool, I was like, I can go grocery shopping and there I don't have two in the cart. And what do I do with two hours, you know, that I don't have to, that I'm not with my kids. I shouldn't say I don't have to. And it's the same thing. Like all of a sudden I'm like, 
Now there's weeks when I don't have a kid in the house. Um, luckily, some of them, you know, they're coming home at different times. So it's been a little bit of an easy, like an ease into it. But I have to say, I just miss them. Like I really, I feel like if I had not pursued writing as my career, which is mm -hmm. such a, as most people in the crowd know, like just such a mega climb, I would have been one of those like, moms who had seven children and there'd still be like three to go right now and I, I I just I like being around kids I just really like even what you were saying about like I was picturing Tracy like well did you like know how to like hog tie them if they really needed it or <laughs> they ordered the skills mine were just like they were easy and and I honestly just really miss them a lot we can't talk about it too much because they used okay. to be here like making when I host Rogue Reads, they would like make the drinks of all the authors. Like I just missed that. <laughs> okay. Well, I won't ask you any more about that. <laughs> we're still waiting a little bit on Nicholas. So we're going to go back to Tracy and hear part of Hometown Vendetta. Okay. All right. So we're starting in chapter three because, you know, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Luke didn't think today could be, get any more surreal. A terrorist attack, a possible connection to his hometown, and Amberlynn Reiner staring at him with her gorgeous brown eyes. Not that Luke should be thinking about her appearance right now or the fact that his revelation had everyone's focus on him. A sensation he didn't like any more now than he had when, he, when he'd been a kid. He fought the urge to squirm. Nina, get a replacement down here for Captain Steele, President Frazier said. Captain, I want you to work with Special Agent Reiner to identify the man in that photo. Sir, a storm of nerves jumbled in Luke's stomach. Surely the president wouldn't want him to step away from his duties to work with the FBI. I know this isn't orthodox, but this situation is bigger than you and me, President Frazier said. If me working short-staffed means we can find the person behind this bombing sooner, so be it. Despite his reservations, Luke answered automatically, yes, sir. Over the next few minutes, Amberlin, Director Thomas or Thompson, and the president discussed possible psychological profiles of the bomber. All the while, the ramifications of what Luke had been asked to do pushed to the forefront of his mind. He'd never told any of his coworkers about the incident with Amberlin in the restaurant when he tried to pass her dessert to her, but had instead managed to drop it in her lap. Never had he been more mortified. He had wanted to impress her so badly that he'd been tongue-tied every time he'd spoken to, she'd spoken to him. Then he'd had to settle for getting her attention by enraging her and embarrassing himself to the point that he'd wished he could disappear and hide under a rock. But he'd swallowed his pride and offered to clean her dress. She'd resisted at first, but when she'd finally consented, he'd experienced a brief glimmer of hope that he could apologize again and maybe even take her out. <clears throat> that plan had died a quick death when he tried texting and calling her only to learn that the number she typed into his phone belonged to some guy named Todd Hart. And while working with Amberlin would be beyond awkward, facing the memories of his hometown would be much worse. Just the thought of the way Russ Gibson used to bully him relentlessly brought back those awkward years of trying to stay invisible and steer clear of the popular crowd or more specifically, the bullies in the popular crowd, most of whom had been on the football team. Being forced to push pennies with his nose across the bathroom floor, the wedgies that had followed when he'd lost the race every time against the football team's other victims. Then there were the invitations to parties that didn't exist, getting blamed for things he didn't do, having his locker broken into and cleared out the day he needed to turn in his three-week research project. And the list went on. Tom, the mili Army military aide, entered the room and relieved Luke of his current duty. Captain, accompany the Special Agent Reiner and work in the watch room. President Frazier stood. I want an update by the end of the day. Yes, sir. Lurked, Luke turned to Amberlin and moved to the door in the corner of the room this way. Very and it goes on. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, got a lot going on in there, I see. Yes, all sorts, of, all sorts of emotions. So who inspired uh, Luke Steele? Let's start with that. So, I mean, it's a combination of a lot of people, but part, a lot of it's my kids. I actually have my, my publisher helped me pick out Luke Steele's name and <laughs> I have a son named Luke. And so I had to get permission from him 
<laughs> to use his name. But he was one of those really shy kids who just didn't really have friends. And, you know, he didn't think he had friends in high school. But mm -hmm. a couple of my daughters were bullied in, in middle school. And so pieces of that came in as well. So, but then I have a friend who worked as an, a military aide for the Marine Corps for the president. And so oh. um, seeing what he went through and being able to experience a lot of those ins and outs of that um, was kind of gave me the, the career for Luke Steele. So it was little pieces of a lot of, you know, a lot of different individuals. Interesting. So you have published 45 books in 20 years. How, how on earth do you do that? <laughs> I mean, just... um I write 2,000 words a day and I just keep doing it <laughs> so yeah I'm actually just hit with my novellas I think look, Hometown Medetta actually is 51 so so it's a lot of but it's 20 years so I started one book a year and then it just kind of gradually has gone up from one to two and then two <laughs> to three and I'm trying to get back down to four <laughs> so Wow. <laughs> so you, can you tell us what you did in the CIA or, or will you have to kill us all? I, I, I won't tell you anything that would force a homicide. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mostly, I was mostly support staff, believe it or not. So um, I primarily was finance. I was a little bit of a jack of all trades. I worked with security facilities um, and then different things with finance, strategic planning, a lot of those sorts of things. But basically, if you see where the money's being spent, you know what's happening. And so I kind of had more of a bird's eye view where, you know, other individuals like I.S. Berry would, was an operative. So um, you'll see, you know, it's, I'm seeing it from a different point of view, but I'm working, I'd worked with all the people who were boots on ground. So, so it was pretty great. Now, you've also co-written books with with um, not one, but three other authors. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide what books you want to co-write and what books you want to write your, just by yourself? So the one that was the three other authors, we did that as kind of a, we needed somebody to talk to during COVID. So we <laughs> together worked on a project together. And we mm -hmm. found that two of us worked exceptionally well together. So we continued with our characters out of that series and moved forward. Um, so we actually just completed the final book in the series won't come out until 2026, but it's, it's now written. So, and we had so much fun. We've already talked about coming up with something to do again. So just a lot of fun. Good. And you have a Facebook page called the, the fiction kitchen trio writers who like to cook and you put out a cookbook. We did. Yeah, me and two of my girlfriends, one of them was uh, Sean Ann Bessie, who I co-author some suspense books with, but the other one is Sarah Eden, who writes historical or historical uh, romance. And we just all found that we had so much food in our in our books and we share an editor and she's like, kept telling us to pare down the, 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 the food references. <laughs> and so we reached out to everyone in, on our Facebook page was like, okay, guys, tell us, do we really have too much food? And like, no, but we want the recipes. And so we kind of, <laughs> it was Sean's idea originally, and she had no idea what it would take to write a cookbook. And I just didn't tell her because I'd written one previously. So <laughs> it was, a, but it was great. I guess we all just wanted each other's recipes is what really <laughs> came down to. So this was a sneaky way to get them. It was. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. It's just, it's an interesting combination. <laughs> I mean, you are an interesting combination of like, you know, CIA super sleuth and then like cookbook writer. You know? Yeah. You know, you just, and then parent to former teenagers. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very fun. Okay. We are going to now let's hear from Stephen and let's hear about buried lies. Okay. Would you like me to read? Yes. Yes, to read us part of part of buried lies. Okay, I'm going to read uh, this is chapter one, buried lies, which is just two and a half pages. Okay. Looking back, when Dale asked me if I wanted to see a dead body, I probably should have said no, but I was bored. I'd been sitting on the deck of my rented cabin for hours, drinking beer, eating chips and guacamole, and staring at Cold Mountain like it held the answers to life's deepest mysteries. So far, the mountain had yet to reveal any of its secrets. But if I'm good at anything, 
It's waiting. My name's Davis Reed. I'm 45 years old, five feet, 10 inches tall, have short brown hair and wear a constant five o'clock shadow courtesy of an expensive stubble groomer my sister gave me for my birthday two years ago. I live in a small cabin in a teeny tiny community called Crusoe that sits on the western end of North Carolina. If you don't know the geography of North Carolina, the state's got three distinct regions, beaches in the east, mountains in the west, and something called the Piedmont in the middle. I've seen all three, and I'll take the mountains any day of the week. I said Crusoe was teeny as well as tiny, and I wasn't kidding. It would be a one red light town if it had a red light, but it doesn't. <laughs> what it does have is a convenience store, a volunteer fire department, a golf course, and a Mexican restaurant that serves the best guacamole in Haywood County. How I got to Crusoe and ended up renting the cabin is sort of complicated. The short version is this. In the fall of last year, I moved here from Charleston, South Carolina, where I'd followed two depressing months as a traffic cop with two depressing decades as a private detective. It's the kind you hire to hide in the bushes and take photos of cheating spouses and chase down insurance frauds. One of those cheating spouses turned out to be my brother-in-law, Greg, who at the time was a sergeant with the Charleston PD. I won't bore you with the details of my confrontation with Greg, other than to say it ended with me getting shot in the leg and almost dying of blood loss on the floor of a storage unit in Mount Pleasant. When I was released from the hospital, I decided to get out of Charleston and recuperate in the quiet solitude of the mountains and try my hand at writing a book. What is this? That led me to I'm on. Oh, but not a whole lot of solitude, nor to a whole lot of writing. So there I was sitting on the deck of the cabin, enjoying the unseasonably warm March weather, drinking a bottle of my home-brewed IPA, and having a staring contest with a 6,000-foot-tall mountain when I heard a vehicle coming up the long gravel drive, followed by the squawk of a siren. My landlord, Dale Johnson, never arrives quietly, but he does arrive often. I guess if I lived with my dad, I'd get out of the house as much as possible, too. How do you eat that shit? Dale said when he squeezed himself into a deck chair next to mine. And I mean squeezed literally. Dale is a big guy. I don't know if it's politically correct to call anyone fat these days, but let's just say Dale is the kind of guy you don't want to see walking down the aisle of an airplane when the only empty seat is the one next to you. I'm surprised they make law enforcement uniforms in his size. Yeah, Dale is not only my landlord, he's also a deputy with the Haywood County Sheriff's Department. Actually, he's the head deputy, a fact that never ceases to amaze me. In the five and a half months I've been renting the cabin, Dale and I have become fairly close. We're about the same age. We both love brewing and drinking good beer. And last November, just a month after I moved in, we survived a somewhat lively adventure involving three murders and some seriously nasty bad guys that culminated at a hiking area next to the Blue Ridge Parkway called Graveyard Fields. Almost getting killed together seems to make people bond. When Dale finally got comfortable, he let out a long sigh then hoisted a 64-ounce glass jug to his lips. That better not be my beer, I said, even though I knew it was. Dale ignored me as he chugged. He wiped his lips with his shirt sleeve, then said, You write anything today? I was about to, but now you're here, messing up my flow. Well, I don't know nothing about writing books, but if I had to guess, I'd say if you've been working on one for five months and ain't written a damn word, then maybe writing ain't your strong point. <laughs> I topped another chip with a glob of guacamole and shoved it close to Dale's face. He smacked it away and the chip sailed over the deck railing like a dead bird. Dale doesn't eat anything from El Baccaratos, or El Bacteria, as he calls it. <laughs> you should do one of them podcast things about that bomber crash, Dale said. All you gotta do is talk. How hard can that be? People don't read shit no more know how. You know, it wouldn't hurt you to pick up a book. Why do I need a book? I got a TV. Dale and I bickered back and forth for about an hour when suddenly the sound of ACDC's Highway to Hell filled the air, Dale's ringtone. It took him a good 15 seconds to wiggle the phone out of his pocket, get it up to his ear. He didn't bother saying hello. Whatever it is, cowboy, I'm off the clock. Dale listened for a moment, then frowned. Why? Who is it? Then a beat later. Damn it, Earl, just tell me. Silence for a few seconds, then fine. I'll come see for myself. Dale grunted, pushed his mask out of the deck chair, and let out a burp that sounded like a cruise ship leaving port. Then he asked me the question I should have said no to, but I didn't. I'm betting the question was, do you want to come with me? <laughs> do you want to see a dead body? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we all, we all never want 
people who ask, you know, <laughs> why haven't you written a word in five, you know, five months? And maybe writing is not what you should do. Yeah, yeah we've all been there. <laughs> I sympathize greatly. Exactly. For a moment, I'm going to digress. Did you say your grandfather ran Butterick Patterns? I used to make Butterick Patterns. Yeah, he did. He was the president of Butterick Patterns. Yeah. Wow. That's a blast from the past. I, of course, I'm about as talented at sewing as you say you are at golf courses. It's like, okay. So you know, we, we matched there. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I kind of I kind of sew like the way I write books, you know, it's like in your mind, it's going to be absolutely astounding. And when it actually comes out, you're like, I probably shouldn't do this again. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So you and Jess were in France this spring. And before that, Scotland and Tokyo. Do you do, you do travel writing or do you just wind up writing about where you travel? You know, or do you travel right? Do travel writing in order to deduct the traveling? <laughs> Well, I, I did a lot of travel writing when I was a freelance magazine writer, but all of those things you just mentioned was, those were just, that was just pleasure travel, actually. I, although I did, I did do a piece about Tokyo for a magazine, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of get a little something out of that. But yeah, that was all pleasure travel. Yeah. So what is your favorite place so far and what's left on the bucket? What's next on the bucket list? Oh, so my wife, Jess, and I just, we absolutely love Edinburgh. She's an economics yeah. professor. Uh, mm -hmm. and she's done three, four month study away programs in Edinburgh. Uh, and I've been with her on two of those. Um, and yeah, that that's our, we feel that's kind of a home away from home in a way. But yeah, we've, we've been very great, very lucky to have, traveled a lot over the past few years but i think if we had to pick one place i think it would be edinburgh yeah edinburgh was amazing i we, we went to scotland too and i don't know if it was there or somewhere we went glasgow loch ness edinburgh and somewhere along the line maybe with sterling we found the oh yeah the, the oldest um li library in scotland i think oh. and, and the nice guy, which I mean, was like the size of a, your average living room. And yeah. <laughs> the guy offered to show me the uh, one of the first editions of, of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And I, uh -huh. I told him, oh, no, no, don't bother. And I've been kicking myself ever since. <laughs> I, I should have looked at it. Yeah. So you, you and your wife, you also installed an Ikea walk-in closet, but met your match in, in wallpaper. Like, first of all, I have to say, don't use self-stick wallpaper. That That's not right. And second of all, don't do wallpaper. It's like, what goes up must eventually come down, and that's a sad and painful day. Yeah, well, well, our mistake was, one, we used wallpaper, and two, we used self-stick wallpaper. <laughs> so, but we survived. We if did you're still that. married... We, we'd only been married a couple of years at that point, and we got through wow, it. Wow, so, that's, so, yeah. that's impressive. Thank you. When I would wallpaper, my husband would leave the house <laughs> and not come back until I was done. I mean, it, that's I know, get it. Yeah. And, and that worked. So what I'm dying to ask, what is the wildest issue you ever had to handle on a golf course? Because when you were a manager. Oh, I don't know if, if there was one uh, <laughs> uh, because my the my family's golf course was 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 actually a resort so we had we had accommodations for over 100 people mm. and so we had people constantly coming in to stay three or four days um uh so yeah we had i mean with golf carts in ponds we had uh odd people showing up at all odd hours of the night knocking on doors we had people locked out <laughs> of the rooms uh we had a uh, one of the maintenance workers uh, went was uh, mowing with a tractor and parked it next to a bathroom, came out of the bathroom. The tractor was gone. He thought someone was playing a joke on him and stole it until he looked into the pond about 100 yards in front of him and <laughs> oh, saw no. bubbles coming up because he'd forgotten to park the locking brake and oh. it had just rolled down the hill into the water. Uh, <laughs> it was constant. It was really a, a constant uh chaos <laughs> yeah 
I believe it. I, I really do. There must be some really wild stories. Yeah. And um, okay, well, we have to say Nicholas has found us. So before I move on to my questions and reading for it with Jenny, um, let's go over to Nicholas and I will tell you about him. Born and raised in New York City by a psychologist, psychoanalyst father and a concert pianist mother, Nicholas Meyer was graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in theater and filmmaking. He now lives in Santa Monica, California. He's an award-winning author, screenwriter and director, creating everything from novels, including The 7% Solution, to movies like Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the best Star Wars, Star Trek movie, in my opinion, and many other people's opinion, and movies like Time After Time, another favorite, and The Day After. In his new book, Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell, with a world war raging on the continent, an exhausted John Watson opens his door to find Sherlock Holmes with a black eye, a missing tooth, and a cracked rib. Amid rebellion in Ireland and revolution in Russia, the two aging friends are dispatched to foil Germany's secret plan to win the war. To do this, they must cross the Atlantic, dodge German U-boats and assassination attempts, and evade the intrigues of young J. Edgar Hoover, while enlisting the help of a beautiful, eccentric Washington socialite. Sherlock's, Sherlock's favorites would likely be a pint of bitter and a plowman's lunch, which for us non-Brits is a cold meal based around bread, cheese, and fresher pickled onions, which sounded really good to me until you got to the onions part. <laughs> so my first question, we all have a pile of questions for you, but let's start with this. Your, your father told you to start writing your own stories when you were six because you'd been making him take dictation from you up until then. And he was a psychoanalyst. Your mother was a concert pianist. Did your mother steer you into music? Do you play an instrument? Well, I'm a sort of a parlor pianist. My mother was bound and determined <laughs> that I should become some kind of pianist. I, I'm a music fool. I really love music and I listen to a lot of it and I have a fairly encyclopedic knowledge but I am no way a professional musician but if you want to talk orchestras conductors composers I can do that till the cows come home <laughs> okay so are you ready to read a little section of uh, your new book to us well I'm going to give it a shot uh, I'm currently traveling at 66 miles an hour don't worry, I'm not driving. Um, <laughs> I hope not. On the 10 interstate heading east. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. All right, I'll give it a shot. These, um, Sherlock Holmes and the telegrams from, from Telegram from Hell, these are extracts from Dr. Watson's diary. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm reading you the opening extract, which is dated the 2nd of June, 1916. Another blood-soaked day. I am spent after 10 hours in surgery. It was nightfall before I could eat the cold supper Mariah had set out for me and bring myself to read the Times there to learn of more millions dying on the Western Front, where the slaughter continues unabated. As both patient and surgeon, I have known the terrible price of battle, but this surpasses anything in my experience. It is hard to believe that the extinction of an entire generation is the price England must pay to prevent the German double-headed eagle waving over Buckingham Palace and the imbecilic Kaiser sitting on his grandmother's throne. I had thought to retire after Julia's death, but instead of finding time for grief, I am obliged to exhaust myself amid the stench of ether and carbolic, treating maimed and disfigured young men 
many little more than boys, who return from France amid a never-ending flood of viscera and missing parts, some arriving still in the remnants of the uniforms in which they were wounded, all bear the same faraway look, as though they were seeing not what was before their eyes, but something unimaginable behind them. Fulham Road is choking on a river of ambulances streaming from the train stations. I am literally trembling with fatigue and know my days as a surgeon are numbered. But the day these travails turn out to have scarcely begun. Sitting alone at my dining table, I became aware of a moaning that I originally imagined to be a summer breeze soughing in the chimney. But the sounds soon resolved themselves into what was unmistakably human. Mariah was weeping in the pantry. Mariah, who has been with us for more years than I care to remember, first engaged by Juliet at the start of our marriage. She has served us ever since with never a murmur of complaint, helping nurse Juliet during the last terrible months of her illness and then staying on to see to my widower's needs ever since. She had a gentleman friend some time ago, but lately I've not seen or heard of him. I dare not ask why. The sobs persisted, so I set down my napkin and wandered into the larder where I found the poor woman in her chair trying to muffle her cries in a tea towel. Mariah, what is it? She started and looked at me as guiltily as if I'd caught her stealing the spoons. I'm so sorry, doctor. She dabbed furiously at her eyes with a towel. Forgive me. I'm sure there's nothing to forgive. Mariah, what's wrong? She shook her head, unwilling or unable to reply. I put a hand on her quaking shoulder. Come, tell me. She allowed my hand to steady her. Taking several deep breaths, she removed the towel and spoke into it. It's Harry, my nephew, Montserrat, wherever that is. Oh, Mariah, my sister's youngest. Only 17, she wailed. I knew for a fact that scenes like ours were played out daily. There was not a home untouched by the war. It was as if the Old Testament angel of death had flown over Britain instead of the Egypt of Moses. Are they certain? She nodded vigorously. They got the telegram this morning. Poor Nellie's youngest, she repeated. And that after Garth and all the rest. And then, unable to restrain herself, she threw herself into my arms, bursting into hot, bitter tears once more. Why? Why doesn't it end? Will it never end? I held her awkwardly. You might better ask why it even began, I murmured. She lifted her red, tear-streaked face to peer up into mine. Why did it? Why must they all die? Everyone said it would be short. They promised. Home before the leaves fall, I remembered. Come, let me pour you some brandy. I never touch it, doctor. Just tonight, I lowered her into the chair, fetched a plain glass, and poured a draft into it. Come, only a swallow. She obeyed, coughing on the drink, wiping fresh tears away with the back of her hand. No one understands. We hate the Germans. The Germans hate us. But the royal family, ain't they German too? Only 17, she repeated swallowing the rest of the brandy at a gulp and huddling bent over gasping for breath as the liquor did its temporary work poor girl what could i tell her how to explain the quicksand of entangling alliances that dragged all europe into this cesspool of blood alliances i can scarcely understand myself no matter how many times speeches and posters have attempted to dim the facts into my head. That an Austrian archduke's assassination in faraway Serbia 
wheresoever that is, as Mariah might say, had somehow brought in Austrians, then the Germans and their strutting war-hungry Kaiser to back them on the one side, forcing Russia, France, England, and Australia, Australia, to honor their alliances with little Serbia on the other? None of that would account for her nephew's death or her father's or two brothers, all of which she had stoically endured to this point with British resolve and a stiff upper lip. But young Harry, torn to pieces at Mont Sorel, was the straw that broke the camel's back. Amid these Saturnine reflections, we were startled by the bell. Instantly, Mariah was on her feet, straightening her apron. I'll see to it, doctor. Nonsense, Mariah. Go up to bed. I'll deal with whoever it is. Go on now. Thank you, doctor. Scouring her eyes yet again with the heels of her hands, she fled upstairs. The bell rang again. Would this day never end? Wondering who on earth might be calling so late, I slipped on my jacket and unbolted the door, astounded to behold a figure emerging like a wraith from a thick, sulfurous fog. Holmes? May I come in? His voice was ragged, not the familiar crisp tones to which I was long accustomed. Certainly, certainly. I may not have, I had not seen my singular friend in over a year. Always favoring a touch of the dramatic, the detective could not have devised a better entrance. I stood aside to let him pass, wondering not only at his unexpected presence, but also his appearance for despite the insufficient, the indifferent lighting. I could see that he sported a black eye and a chipped by cuspid. And a cracked rib, I fear, he confided, noting my confusion. Come into the surgery, let me see. First, let me sit. Knowing better than to insist, I gestured to a chair by the hearth, though at this time of year there was no need of a fire. Holmes lowered himself carefully into the chair and sat still for several moments, his eyes closed. Holmes, what has happened to you? Who has done this? Could you see the blackguards? And why are you not in Sussex attending to your bees? I did it to myself, Watson. Or rather, it was done at my direction. That's my little excerpt. <laughs> very, very interesting. Let's hope. That's, yes. <laughs> So the return of the Pharaoh was set in 1911, and this book is five years later, as obviously, you know, World War I is, is getting going. What made you decide to delve into Great War espionage? Um, it's hard to say where ideas come from. I read a lot of history, and I read a lot of biography, and for that sort of thing, I I seem to have a very retentive memory. And some years ago, and I mean this, the book that I'm about to refer to was published in 1950. I was only five then, so I was probably 20 when I read Barbara Tuckman's book, The Zimmerman Telegram. And that mysterious piece of paper is what brought America into World War I. And about five years ago, another book with the exact same title, The Zimmerman Telegram, was published by a historian named Thomas Boghart, who uh, gives a lot of credit to Barbara Tuckman, uh, who you may remember won the Pulitzer Prize for The Guns of August, which was about the start of World War I. Mm -hmm. um, and the story of the Zimmerman telegram is so nuts. <laughs> and at the uh, just, it's so crazy um, that when that new book came out, the Thomas Boghart book, which is about five years ago, I started 
ruminating about that. And in my life, all roads lead to Sherlock and have since I was 11 <laughs> years old. So um, it, it's, it's like I thought, well, and then I learned very shockingly that the British agent in Mexico City, who actually got his hands on the telegram, mm -hmm. went by the code name H. Mm. And I thought, oh, do they have to draw me a picture? <laughs> uh, so that's how the book came about. Oh. There's nowadays there's there's many books featuring newer incarnations of, you know, Sherlock Holmes, Sam Spade, Philip Marlowe, or turning people like Teddy Roosevelt or Jane Austen into detectives. But was the seven percent solution the first or at least the first to get a lot of attention? I think that's fair to say what happens is that small boys of around 11 <laughs> stumble onto the complete Sherlock Holmes stories of Arthur Conan Doyle. There are 60. There are 56 short wow. stories and four novellas. And, mm -hmm. then be, and then comes life's darkest hour when you get to the end and there's no <laughs> more. And I am certainly not the first who wanted to write or attempted to write continuations. There, have, there, there were plenty and plenty of movies, mm -hmm. most of which I despise. Um, <laughs> I should insert at this point that I'm a, I'm a Doyle purist. I don't want his son. I don't want his daughter. I don't want his brother. I don't want him <laughs> in outer space. I don't want a gay Sherlock. I just want it like Doyle. Mm -hmm. And so when I sat down to write the 7% solution, I was trying to do two things and one was well three if you count wanting to write my own Sherlock Holmes story and two I wanted to make it sound as much like Doyle as possible and three I was very intrigued by the potential similarity and relations potential relations between Sherlock Holmes and Sigmund Freud which actually began with my wondering about Doyle and Freud because they were both doctors, doctors mm -hmm. who wrote, they, they were writers. They died in the same town within nine years of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that Freud's favorite bedtime reading, wait for it, were the <laughs> Sherlock Holmes stories. So I thought, Oh, this is interesting. And then I learned that, you know, they were both, um, Holmes is a cocaine addict, or at mm -hmm. least he is for a time. And Freud for a time was also a cocaine user. He got involved with two eye doctors, Koenigstein and Kohler, on the uses of cocaine as an anesthetic during eye surgery. Hmm. And Arthur Conan Doyle studied ophthalmology for six months in Vienna. And I thought, do they have to draw me a picture? <laughs> Again. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I was a kid. I was like 26 when I wrote the book, 27. And I just sat down and had a high old good time. I, it did not occur to me that this was going to become the number one best-selling novel in the United States and bring <laughs> Sherlock back from the dead um it was all news to me <laughs> well i absolutely love that but um we're before we start getting super short on time don't go away we're going to go over to jenny and hear part of the usual silence <laughs> well first i have to tell mr meyer that the day after I put this in the chat, like affected my whole generation and yes. it gave us all a day off of school. <laughs> well, if it did nothing more than that. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so The Usual Silence um, is the first book in my first series. And the publisher of Amazon approached my agent and asked if I would talk about a series that sort of made use of my psychotherapy background and Arl Shepard is 
uh, my psychologist sleuth, or though we're going to begin right at the beginning of this book, which is with Cass Monroe, a dad in Maine. It was that bleak, barren time of year when even winter is dying. Cassius Monroe walked along the lean, curving bone of his driveway, looking out for his daughter. He had nodded off in his living room chair, surprised when he'd startled awake. Only a few minutes, 15 at the most, but still, napping in the afternoon. Like his father used to do, like Cass was an old guy already. His boots crushed brittle leaves to dust and he stooped to pick up branches, tossing them into the woods with the deadfall that had dropped on its own. His days were unmarked now. He could get this half mile drive that led to their house sparkling like a kitchen floor with all the free time he had on his hands. He hated it. Hours trickling away from him, hardly registering, they were gone. But even though he wasn't a working man at the moment, he was still a dad who had responsibilities. In fact, with his wife, the wage earner for the time being, he was the primary taken for, caretaker for their sixth grade daughter. And he usually sensed it when B was due to come walking in, school bus having let her off at the road. She was a little late today. He walked into the middle of the road, turning so he could look around the curves. Salty air drifted inland as it did when the wind Try came in from the east, sound. Mute it. In instead of being blown out to sea. His eyes stung and he wrinkled his nose against the tang. Usually he liked being reminded of that distant shoreline, but today the smell troubled him, made him think of preservation, heaps of salt used to ward off decay. There was no hint of diesel in the air, exhaust from a school bus. Not all the way to worried yet, a dozen things could happen to make a school bus late, unless B wasn't on the bus at all. His mind was scattered lately, less focused than usual. His wife complained about it. There were music lessons on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it was Monday. B had a new buddy this year. Maggie had told him how friend groups dissolved at this age, leaving the girls adrift. Finding someone to hang out with, share secrets with, just to eat lunch with could be hard. <clears throat> he couldn't stand the thought of his daughter's days marching by as toneless and unscored as his own. Would it be weird if he called the new friends parents? But B wouldn't just make a play date or whatever big girls of 12 called them without letting him know. He and Maggie had been prepared for all sorts of tween acting out, but even in the midst of her friendship crisis, B stayed close. He stood by the side of the road, shifting uneasily from foot to foot while a screw tightened in his chest. Then he caught the strain of an engine making its climb up the hill and he took a relieved step back onto the sandy shoulder. He painted a casual expression on his face for B, who might be embarrassed, her dad meeting the bus like she was a kindergartner, concealing the fact that he'd been worried for a moment there because he spent way too much time these days floating around, no restrictions on where his mind might roam. Then a tractor crested the hill, its driver lifting one hand in a wave. Cass stared at the vehicle as it chugged along. Normally, he wouldn't have any trouble telling the engines apart. His heart thrummed a guitar strung too tight. He turned and marched back to their house. Hmm. It has a, a overwhelming like sense of dread with practically every word. Um, you were a psychologist for many years. So did you, did you stop in order to write or were you writing while you were still working as a psychologist or? So I was How a psychotherapist because I never finished the dissertation. I'm ABD. I just have to make that correction because I would right. love to have that darn dissertation done. Yes. Um, if anybody <laughs> wants to do it, you know, tag team it. Um, yes, I stopped working when my second child was born. My father had been taking care of our first and we thought like two in diapers might be a little much for Poppy. Mm. But yeah. Um, yeah, I practiced. I worked at a rural community mental health center and I specialized in treating children. And I decided to start, I'd always wanted to be a writer, but I decided to start writing novels when I was given this very scary case as a psychotherapist. And it was a oh. mother who had brought her five-year-old kind of angelic daughter in to see me. And the daughter had just killed a bird. Oh. 
Wow, that's interesting. Do you find do you find yourself using real life examples like that from your former patients in your books, and then think, then stop yourself and think, no, they'll recognize themselves, and I'll get sued. Right, right. And there's confidentiality. It's really more of an ethical yeah. thing. My first uh, unpublished novel, which was a bloated 180,000 words that I swore everyone was needed, was based on that story. And, and it was almost as if I had to write it to realize that fiction really has to be completely made up for me anyway. You know, my writing took off when I began making it all up. So I don't think any of my patients mm. would really see themselves in any of my work, but it's interesting for me to create now Arles as a character because certainly I can go back to my internship <laughs> days and my early practice days and remember what it was like to be, you know, kind of steamed up. I mean, we were given like these life and death literally situations. I worked on the psychiatric emergency hotline and we had such important work to do, and it's so hard to do it. Um, and I do think that infuses the first book in the series. Well, yeah, that's kind of the way, and you know, in forensic science too, it's like yeah. I don't, I don't usually use real life cases because you you need the freedom to be able to go where your your mind takes you. Yeah. So you worked on it. You you said a little bit about it. You worked on a book for two years, and then a a publisher um, abruptly wanted to meet with you and said, hey, let's do a series. <laughs> yeah. And you suddenly dove into that. So so tell us, tell us how that came about. I mean, so I did. I worked on another, I changed agents, which was a big kind of career juncture for me. And I had been working on a book and we worked on it very, very intently together. Um, and at a certain point, we sort of realized this book is not going to be published in the way we want it to be published unless things sort of go differently in my career. And we were sitting there sort of gobsmacked and not sure what to do about that when like a deus ex machina, the publisher of Amazon came out and said to my agent, would Jenny be willing to, you know, breakfast with me? And I know it was breakfast, not dinner, but still, I was totally willing. Are you to kidding? Right. Like a publisher right. invites you to a meal? Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then we sat down and Arles was born and it was exciting and wonderful. And really, I think the way I have survived the writing life so far is just by really looking for anything that might open, whether it's a door or other, and being willing to go through. So what about the other book, if I can ask? Is that so, uh, what... Right, it, it sits here, waiting for a movie maker like Nicholas Meyer, no, I kid. Um, <laughs> it sits here, it sits here, wait, you know, and it'll, I hope it will come out and be sold and published at the right time in the right way. It's a very like kind of unusual, new and different book. Um, one of the things my agent kept saying to me when we were working on it was like, this is a character who's never been seen before. So it definitely needs to come out once a writer is sort of established with a, direction, I think. It's good that it didn't sell, although at the time it felt like, you know, a blow to the, the gut and the chest and the neck and the everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've been there. So, <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're after the eight o'clock hour. So I think I want to open it up to questions from everybody. Chris, um, do we have, do we have questions from the chat do, that I'm not seeing? Do we have questions from we Facebook? We do have a couple questions. Um, one of the questions was um, for, um, let's see, where is it? Um, I'm sorry, I have to go okay. back here. This one was for Tracy from Shelley Plum. Mm -hmm. um, was what characters in your latest book do you most identify with? Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know about my latest book because it was mostly family members. But my upcoming book in April, um, the novel, a novel threat, it's um, the main character is CIA finance, which is what I was. She was a closet writer, which I also was. My husband didn't know I was a writer until I literally had sent a book in to be, you know, into a publisher. Um, but, you know, CIA, you know how to keep secrets. So it kind of worked. <laughs> um, so I think that's, it's probably that that character in novel threat would be the one most that I would connect to the most. 
Okay, and now Thank I have you. a question <laughs> for everyone. Um, and it's it's based on listening to you all and listening to the voices that you brought to your reading. Um, you all did a very great job with your readings. And I was really impressed with everyone's. And Nicholas, your reading, um, I have a friend, a good friend, um, Stephanie, Ma uh, Stephanie Meyer, Francine Matthews, who wrote a Stephanie Barron. She wrote the um, Jane Austen series. And she writes she channels Jane Austen while she's writing. I mean, it's kind of amazing. You'll go to tea with her, breakfast with her or something, and she actually talks like Jane Austen while you're there. She feels <laughs> like she's awesome. inside her the whole time. Um, yeah. And I thought, Stephen, your voice was hilarious. I mean, <laughs> really, and I yes. wanted to know if you think comedically like that or if you actually work to make it comedic. So how do each of you approach the voice that you use in your work? Uh, well, for me, though, those are the voices just whispering in my ears. And I, I can't turn them off, even though I'd like to sometimes. But um, yeah, it's just there. Uh, I When I wrote my first book, Graveyard Fields, I, when I, I started out trying, I wanted to write something dark. The first note I wrote to myself when I when I started the novel was make it dark. And then the third sentence was a joke. And I thought, oh, well, I guess I can't do that. I just have to go where I go. Um, so, Can yeah, it's come out funny. It's just okay. That, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it's funny. Yeah, it is funny. I don't know sometimes, but yeah. it was enjoyable to listen to. Thank you. Thank you very much. For me, if anybody's asking. Um, I don't really have a lot of choices. I am writing in a foreign language. Um, I am trying, uh, you used the word before, channeling in relation to Jane Austen. Um, and we refer to certain artists, great ones, as inimitable, meaning you can't imitate them. And yet the task if you're trying to write like Jane Austen or you're trying to write like Arthur Conan Doyle, you are trying to imitate what is inimitable. And you'll be lucky if you just come close, if you're in the ballpark. Um, you know, to start a book by saying it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a fortune must be in want of a wife. That's hard to top. Um, <laughs> Maybe call my Ishmael, you know, runs at a close second, but otherwise it's tough. And it's like you're, you're, you're Beethoven, but you're, you're deaf and you're trying not to let people know it. Um, because one clinker and you go, wait, that's not Jane Austen. That's not Arthur Conan Doyle. There's not a lot of wiggle room. Does your editor catch errors that you make in voice? <laughs> Sometimes he thinks he does. I, he, he went, at one point uh, commented on a novel of mine, a Holmes novel, and said, uh, Holmes never refers to Watson as my boy. And I said, for how much? <laughs> for how much? And then I showed him like four places. And, you know, I, then I don't need to hear any more corrections from, <laughs> from him. Um, as I was on a panel the other day when uh, Michael Connolly said, the only words I want to hear from my editor are thank you. Um, <laughs> this, this gets into another question or another subject, which is what do we think about editors? But well, we can save that for another uh, time. <laughs> All I will only say is that they these days, they tend to be few and far between, and most of them are deal makers, unless your other guests are going to tell me otherwise. Yeah, no, I will. My editor is like a creative kindred spirit who, <laughs> if I say like, I read a bunch of these reviews mistakenly and thought maybe, you know, next time X, she's like, absolutely not. Do what the story tells you. 
Well, well you, you know, you have a fairy godmother or fairy godfather, um, <laughs> but they are not, they are truly not common. Um, the publishing business is in such sort of chronic disarray that the idea of the editor or the agent for that matter as some kind of muse and, and who is really interested. A couple of editors ago, I at a, at a different publishing house, um, I, I said to my editor, well, don't, maybe this chapter should edit end four pages earlier and we should spill the rest of it over to the next chapter. And he goes, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> And I thought, I'm in real trouble here. I'm in real trouble. I am not getting help. Um, I'm not getting a... Uh, I being... Because they don't have time. Mm -hmm. Maxwell, where art thou? <laughs> no, I will say... Well, the other question is whether you are actually making the book better or mm -hmm. just making it shorter. It, it may not necessarily be the same. True. Tracy, you had a comment? Well, I was just going to say, I actually have a gem. My, my, I've had my editor for more than three dozen books. Um, oh. And then when I, when she switched publishers, she pulled me with her. <laughs> um, and so, but we actually like, we'll do, I mean, I'm a complete discovery writer and I'm getting ready to start a new book probably tomorrow or the next day. And at some point this week, we'll have a conversation of like, all right, what are we doing? You know, what do you think of this idea? And we'll actually talk out the, the general idea of what the story pr premise will be. If I have a problem, I'll call Oh my God. So I am I am <laughs> the most blessed author on the planet when it, okay, except for the rest of the ones who have her. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I- did, did you say you've written three dozen books? Um, 51 oh, is, are on the shelves. Yeah, 51. <laughs> yeah so I Keep like really. it's very rare though because most people end up having so many editor editorial changes so I think mm -hmm. but you know when we talk about voice I think that's one of the reasons why I've been able to be very consistent she's I have a very dry sense of humor that tends to hit the pages and <laughs> um she's she just rolls with it she's like yep that's Tracy it's just but I at one point I even got a list of Tracy-isms um of the things that I was <laughs> overusing <laughs> So, How long does it take you to produce a book? Yeah, um, I was wondering that myself. Two to three months. Wow. <laughs> oh my God, you're like Anthony Trollope. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it takes me a lot longer than that. And I can tell you, I was blessed with an agent in my, with my thrillers that actually, a, he sent me a 10 page single space letter with notes after he bought my book um and oh. i thought why did he buy it he hated it i called my agent <laughs> i'm like he, he must have hated it and he said pay attention to what he tells you and think about it and i tell you i sat down and i had to reconstruct the first half of the book because i had things chronologically screwed up mm. Once I fixed that and the ripple effect of all those changes, mm -hmm. that book was so much better and it was nominated for a lot of awards and it, wow. I mean, it was, it made it so much better. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had other editors that weren't as helpful. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm okay. going to ask the couple of these people and the, I'm going to bring you in and see if you have any questions for our authors. Deborah or Shelly, do either of you have any questions? <laughs> Shelly? Um, I actually do have a question. And um, I, I, because when I write, it's almost like a piece of me comes out. I, it's like I identify and I honestly even learn so much about myself personally and I am curious if I'm alone with that meaning with each of you authors do you when you're done with a book do you learn something new about yourself that you didn't know beforehand hmm. I don't know if it's so much know. learning something yeah. new <laughs> as it is reinforcing what I already know but I again I've written a lot of books but there there's certain themes that are very consistent, like patriotism, loyalty, 
you know, those types of things are going to be in my book. And I don't, it took me a lot of years before I realized that, that certain things mm-hmm. just, and, and I'm always going to have some type of a humor, you know, some type of humor in there. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's fantastic. I would say it's maybe the opposite for me that as I learn about myself or go through changes or stages, then the books become different to, in a reflection of that process. I think that I, I've, I learn everything very slowly. Well, let's be more <laughs> blunt. I, I'm the last person to understand anything. Um, uh, the only thing that can be said in my defense is that when I finally understand it, I understand it very, very well. Um, and finally, I don't know, about two weeks ago, I finally understood my relations, my relationship to Sherlock Holmes. Um, it's only taken me 50 years or possibly longer, but Sherlock is my mouthpiece. Sherlock is my alter ego. Sherlock is how I get to express my ideas, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my tastes. Um, I'm the ventriloquist and he's sort of the dummy. Um, this is what I sort of have learned uh, over the years. These are not the only kinds of books, uh, you know, I, I I write or I'm also in the in the movie business, but I think as far as Holmes is concerned, and I have now completed seven books because over 50 years, I don't write them quite as fast um, as other people. Um, but I, I, and I think that putting something that is on my mind into what's going on with Sherlock is truer than to say I've taken things out. But if I distill, because I want Sherlock always to remain in character, he has to always be Sherlock. Um, I'm, I'm kind of going in circles, but I think you get the <laughs> idea. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, at, at, for me, at least my books are very personal. I'm kind of like Nicholas. I learn things very slow and, and unlike him, I don't come out of them knowing much more than I went into them. Uh, but with, when I started writing my first book, Graveyard Fields, I was in a, a very dark place and I, I wanted to create a character who was like me and put him in a dark place and see how he dealt with the same kind of feelings I was feeling. And uh, like I said earlier, my, my plan was make it dark. And then I, I just wanted bad things to happen to this person because that's how I was feeling at the time. And then what happened just organically was instead of surrounding him by darkness, I surrounded him with really bizarre funny characters and absurd situations and just put him in places where even he had to laugh at the absurdity of what he was dealing with uh and that helped me personally uh kind of deal with what i was going through so yeah both of my books have been very very personal to me i mean dealing with the second book which takes place at at the golf course that my family owned for 50 years. And I mean, the reason I left the golf business in 2008 wasn't because I wanted to, it's because my mom fired me. Uh, <laughs> so I had to do something different. And uh, if you do, if you remember what was going on in the winter of 2008, that was the recession. So there oh. wasn't a lot to do. And I was a single dad with two young kids and fully responsible for them. And it was before, kind of working from home was a thing in a way and to me I thought well writing is a way to freelance writing is a way you can work from home right now um but yeah it's all been incredibly personal for almost too personal in a way for me Shelly it's it's been really really personal 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else? Or I have one quick question to, to ask everybody. And then I think we're going to have to wrap it up because we're like way over yeah, time. Yeah, because we're going to go up Loma Vista. Yeah. Um, what is next for you? What is what are you working on right now? What do you what do you got coming up next? Jenny, go. Arl Shepherd number two. I am in the midst of editing because uh, you know uh, <laughs> it has to be done, and uh, it comes out September twenty twenty five. Cool, Tracy. So I've got like ten in the pipeline, but the next <laughs> hardback is Novel Threat, <laughs> which comes out on April Fool's Day twenty twenty five. Oh, nice cover. Thank you. Um, Nicholas, what's what's next for you? What are you working on right now? Nicholas. The, the next Holmes <laughs> novel, which is, uh, oh. that, which is probably the last one, is called Sherlock Holmes and the Real Thing. Oh. Uh, it's about art forgery. And it'll okay. come out... Uh, Probably in about a year, something like that. They'll they'll tell me, and then we'll argue. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, Stephen. What what are you working on now? Uh, I'm just going to finish this beer and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean like right now. That's as far <laughs> forward as I'm looking. So. <laughs> okay, well that's that's a good practice. Uh, I just want to thank all of you so much. I have the winners of our author's books for, for uh, from the registrants. Can you see that or is that backwards? You can see it. Okay, see in my in my screen, I think it's backwards. But anyway, <laughs> um, if this is your email handle, you have won a book, but you have to write to us to let me know. And US addresses only, please. So sorry, we're out of time. This has been a really fun, um, event tonight. Join us next month on November 18th to visit with J.T. Ellison, Daniel Elliman, Pip Drysdale, all the way from Australia, and our own rogue, Tracy Clark. So, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very thank much. You, thank, thank you, Chris. Really wonderful. Bye, authors. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.